Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Scott Lamp, a chiropractor with the Zell Center for Healing. Been working there at the office for probably more than 11 years and about oh, 26 years of experience uh, working with different health issues. And this is this is a this is a whopper. Sugar addiction, public enemy number one, is one of the major problems that we have today in major health circles, from things from cancers to heart disease, obesity. This is the number one player in trying to learn to control this is taking you to a direction of ultimate ultimate health. All our programs that we do in our office have to do are off the basis of this triangle. Everything has a chemical element, too much, too little, things you're exposed to, pollutants, the stresses of life, the emotional components, structure, the pressures that we put on our organs, muscles, and joints. And even in the middle portion, you could even say genetics can play a part. And any problem you have physically, chemically, emotionally, you've got to look at the triangle. You've got to look at all the parts of it. You look at the whole being of the person to figure out what the problem is. So how should you feel after you eat? Should you feel better, same, worse? You should feel the same. Because if you're feeling better, your sugars might be too low. And if you're feeling worse, you're actually taking too much sugar in and the body's trying to transfer it to fat. When it does that, it takes a lot of energy and that's why your body feels like it's kind of like tired. Question number two, what do you think raises your sugar levels the highest? Do you think it's carbs? Do you think it's protein? Do you think it's fat? Or protein and carbs? Think about a second. Number one is protein and carbs. The one that does it the least amount is fat. I want you to think about burning calories like a fireplace. If I put leaves on this fire, they burn very quickly. That would be a simple carbohydrate. If I put twigs on this or small, smaller branches, that would be like a, like a complex carbohydrate. Still burns fairly fast, but lasts a little bit longer than leaves. If I put a mm, log on this, that lasts a little bit longer. And I think that's kind of like fats and proteins. It takes a little bit while for it to break down. And the longer you have something to break down, the more stable your sugars can be in your system. The problem with handling sugars is trying to maintaining in the good area here. And that's, in that way is where the body functions the best. But if we take too many calories or carbs per meal, and that's every time we eat, then we have a spike up in blood sugars. And then the blood sugar is there, the body tries to store it, but sometimes what happens, we have insulin coming in, grabbing the sugar and dropping it down. Now the sugar drops. And as it says, if I skip a meal and restrict calories or carbs or exercise on an empty stomach, I get the sugar drop too much. So the body has to burn muscle, hold on to fat, energy crashes and cravings increase. So now we have this up and down ratio, and we really want to control that as much as we possibly can. So if we have foods that are high in the glycemic, it means how fast they get into the system, and there's a sugar level, you can actually look them up and find glycemic index forms on your, in the internet. High glycemic index, how fast sugar turns into sugar, when you have processed carbohydrates, they break down into sugar faster, causing very fast and higher spikes. Insulin spike causes resistance over time. It means resistance, the body says, I can't keep on taking this. I want to start closing the door. It's called something called insulin resistance. Excessive sugar in foods that aren't sweet. These are in other locations. And high fructose corn syrup, which is really the bad guy. The soda, sweet foods, microwave dinners, condiments, chips, snacks, yogurts, smokes, etc. Those are all in those. And again, high glycemic index shows you what happens with your blood sugar level. Low glycemic index gets closer into that area that we want to be in is right here. We have maximizes our ability to handle sugars. 
all cells need energy to run. We just have to come up with a balancing act. Here's an example of that balancing act. Here's the hormones, but they have an effect from cortisol and adrenal. This is the master gland, the master or primary, primary gland or hormone. And the stress responses, you can put sugar in the system because of just the adrenal gland. So one of the things I want you to realize, there's two ways to put sugar in your body. You can eat it or you can stress it. And this is showing it here. Now, pancreas, there's some things with insulin and blood sugars and have a big effect on your thyroid gland. So if you have some thyroid problems, uh, and I'm expecting especially also on the women's side for Hashimoto's thyroiditis, sugar plays a big part. And sometimes sugar can mimic a thyroid problem or thyroid problem has a big sugar handling problem. Here's the sugar addiction in the perpetual cycle. You eat sugar, you like it, you start to crave it. It has addictive properties. Where that comes in is the addictive properties come from, from something that creates, it releases dopamine, which causes addiction. Mass insulin secreted, it tries to pull all this sugar to try to keep it back in the zone, but sometimes it drops down too far. High insulin causes immediate fat storage, okay? Body craves the, craves the lost high sugar, hunger and cravings, low blood sugars, cause increased appetite and cravings, thus the cycle repeats itself. Our daily intake of sugar averages about 95 grams, which might not sound like a lot, but that adds up to about 77 pounds per year. And some people are over 100. The American Heart Association recommends a daily intake of 36 grams for an adult male, 20 grams for an adult female, and 20 gra 12 grams for a kid. Well, if you have a soda, forget about that. As a result, obesity has become a major issue with one to three adults and two to five kids showing various degrees of it. As we said before, potentially addictive is sugar and dopamine plays a big part on it. Studies have shown that sugar can be addictive as drugs and alcohol. It is, however, more difficult to avoid sugar as there are thousands of packaged food items in the grocery stores today with about 80% of them containing added sugars. Key thing on labels, look at the total carbs, not the total sugars, because there's hidden sugars like starches that can be on those labels. So if you really want to look at how much sugar potential or problems are, look at total carbs. Again, drinking one of today's popular beverages, you're already gone over the daily recommendation. The average kind of soda contains about 40 grams of added sugar, while bottles, while, while bottles have around 42 grams. One of Starbucks coffee contains about 47 grams of added sugar. So what's the end result of having too much sugar? And really is there's major players and it's obesity. Our blood pressure starts to get high. Our blood starts to get thicker, um, some disease process that happens to our arterial walls, but also the blood gets more viscous, harder to move. So you have increasing this, you have increasing in your blood uh, fasting glucose in your laboratories and lipids are going to be things like your cholesterol raises. And one of the problems with this is heart disease. We'll all talk about things about lipids being high and sugar type potentials, all kinds of things that make it harder for the heart. Affects lipid metabolism, hypertension, blood pressure goes up, type 2 diabetes, diabetes can have problems. We can actually have thought processes or problems, brain fog, dementia. Real big one here is cancer because cancer cells, the receptor sites on the outside membranes are probably the most dense for sugar or carbohydrate than any other cell in the body. And so it's like a screaming baby getting wanting attention, feed me, feed me, feed me. And that's why it's so important in cancer to actually lower your blood sugars or eating bad foods because all you're doing is exponentially making it worse. Polycystic ovarian syndromes. When we deal with sugars that are out of control, we're literally in males and females, we start to swap our hormones. So a person who's a male has testosterone, goes more to estrogen. And in that fact, high, high estrogens is inflammatory for the male and not good for the heart. 
Same thing with women. Women go from, from having estrogen being converted into testosterone. Testosterone, ovarian um, uh, uh, syndrome, polycystic ovarian syndromes. So, so cysts start to form, hair starts growing on the face, those things, and it's because the switch of testosterone, and a lot has to be laid in the feed of sugar. Non-alcoholic um, fatty liver disease. And we have a lot of people with insulin resistance that have fatty livers. And you can maintain the fatty livers for a point, but then you get into cirrhosis and there's no return. And that's going to be uh, kind of liver, liver failure at that point. So glucose has a couple different patterns. We can be decreased or we can be elevated. And when we have high uh, sugars, we're talking about things like diabetes. So that would be here. We have large amounts, glucose over 126. When we find it in our laboratory works, hemoglobin A1C will go over, but it's over 6.5. These are all the factors there that you'll see. And again, you can see triglycerides and cholesterol are things that are all related directly to how much sugar is in the system. So if those numbers are up, you got to really look at your sugar numbers to see if a problem. There is some other disease processes that can have a little bit of change on that, but the first thing you got to is really looking at the sugars. Um, if you look on the other side, this is like the fun functional hyperglycemic, we have ranges below 65, and we'll talk about how that feels. But again, it's really, you got no sugars, you have no energy, you feel like you should stand up, you're gonna pass out. And there's some other additional ones, there's mixed patterns. And then there's also an interesting one here, it's called a latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood. And what happens is you start off with a type of type 2 diabetes and it comes actually becomes a autoimmune disease it's actually the body starts affecting uh, attacking the pancreas and ends up being like a type 1 diabetic we'll go over those in a minute some of the measures for uh, how your sugar levels are going one of the best ones to do is hemoglobin a1c it's a measurement for diabetics but I like it functionally too it measures the average of blood sugar levels over the three months and how they look at it is they look at how the red blood cell looks with the sugar attachments to it. This has a lot of sugars to it. This has a low amount to it. And normal is below 5.7, pre-diabetes 5.7 to 6.3, diabetes 6.4. Your goal is to try to keep it a low, maybe about 5.5 or lower. So sugar glycation of proteins or fats causes this. It's very inflammatory and can vary due to other factors. These are your blood file. These are your blood labs that you might me take a look at. There's a standard file that goes like here, which is standardly ordered. Um, again, you can see the cholesterols. There's an HDL cholesterol and a, and a LDL cholesterol. Um, HDL is supposed to be considered the good cholesterol, only because it seems to be taking cholesterol from the body and then taking it to liver to get get rid of it. And then the LDL is doing the reverse. It's actually the liver is making the cholesterol and going putting it out to the body. Um, total cholesterol ratio number is an interesting one, and you want to make sure that you're probably looking at something about uh, 3.1 or below is what your goals are. And so these are the standards. But we like to look at all their special orders. And the other ones have to do with inflammation too, because sugar likes to create a lot of inflammation. And we look at homocysteine as being one of those. C-reactive protein, that's something that happens in the liver. Um, lipoprotein phenotyping profile. Take those cholesterol numbers, and you might have a cholesterol that actually has a different class. There's class, like for example, LDL has a class A and a class B. Class A are big, plumpy LDLs, and class B are not so. They're smaller, smaller cholesterols, and those, those ones have a tendency to break and have more of a problem. So you can have higher LDLs, but they'd be good quality LDLs. You can have higher HDLs, but some of them can be very poor in transporting some of those things back to the liver. Um, fibrogen activity, another big one to take a look at, and prothrombin time is your kind of like clotting, clotting times. Those are good information to tell you about how you're handling um, your sugars. Let's talk a little bit more about hyperglycemia. Normal blood sugar should be 72 to 108. I still like to see, in my viewpoint, sometimes maybe closer to be a little bit above 80. But you have tiredness, excessive sweating, dizziness, headache, and mental confusion. You feel like symptoms of withdrawal. 
You can feel like cravings, lethargy or lack of energy, anxiety, headaches, muscle pain, insomnia, chills, nausea, gas and bloating. So the following withdrawal symptoms of sugar addiction manifest as early as 24 hours after quitting sugar intake. The body's more, moving more on a sugar burning pathway, or sometimes you want to go into more of a fat burning process. Here's hypoglycemia, where we're going to be working it backwards, and our complaints are going to be fatigue, insomnia, depression, mood disorders, low metabolism, weight gain, headaches, hormone imbalances. The main things can't sleep, get some headaches a lot, and maybe standing up and just kind of like, you know, I feel like I'm, I stand up almost like I'm going to pass out. Hypoglycemic symptoms, craving sweets, irritable between missed meals, uh, hangry, depend on coffee, lightheaded with missed meals, eating relieves fatigue, jittery or shaky, agitated, nervous, poor memory, forgetful, blurred vision. So the lifestyles that do this is missing meals, avoiding snacks, high amount of snacks, caffeine, nicotine to suppress hunger, sweets instead of a meal, long gaps between dinner and first meal, lack of protein or fiber in the diet because you'll find out that fiber kind of binds up sugar, overtraining without replenishing glucose. Pre-diabetics in our country means before diabetes, totals about 84.1 million adults age 18 years of older have pre-diabetes. 65 years or older, 23.1 million adults age 65 years or older have pre-diabetes. Here's a look at too much sugar, and we're going to work that backwards. And the complaints are those are usually fatigue. You can get joint pain, depression and mood disorders, infertility, slow metabolism and weight gain, hormone imbalances, the resistant symptoms, fatigue after meals, because it takes a lot of work to kind of turn something into fat, crave uh, sweets during the day, Eating sweets doesn't resolve your cravings. Difficult losing weight, must have sweets after meals. Resist the resistance dietary and lifestyle, lack of physical energy, overeating, high sugar and high starchy meals, social and pleasure eating, lack of fiber in your diet. And fiber again, binds things up. The diabetes is 30.3 million people have diabetes in the United States and then said that probably about 2030, maybe 2050, we might be as much as 50 percent. Diagnosed are 23.1 million people, undiagnosed is 7.2 million people, and this number from the CDC keeps on increasing. Diabetes has over close to 800,000 cases of diabetes diagnosed each year. We're spending $98 billion spent annually on diabetes. 650 million people die each year from diabetes and complications. Diabetes mellitus type 2 is no longer an adult onset disease. And there are secondary costs. $245 billion that plays here. These are monthly type of expenses that we have. Syringes, uh, test strips, medications. So here's some more technical definitions of um, diabetes. Diabetes mellitus type 2, formerly non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, or adult onset diabetes is a metabolic disorder that's characterized by too much sugar in the contents of insulin resistance and relact a relative lack of insulin. Type 2 diabetes makes up about 90% of cases of diabetes. Diabetes type 1, and which is an absolute lack of insulin due to the breakdown of islet cells in the pancreas. Classic symptoms are excessive thirst, frequent urination, and consistent constant hunger. Approximately 10% 10, 10 of all diabetics are diabetics type 1. We talked about this before, the latent autoimmune diabetes of adults, slow onset type 1 diabetes or diabetes 1.5 is a form of diabetes mellitus type 1 that occurs in adults often with a slower course of onset. Adults with LADA may initially be diagnosed as having type 2 diabetes based on their age, particularly of a risk factor of type 2 diabetes, such as strong family history or are obese. Diabetes is a great complicator of heart disease. In the red, you see that actually a combination of heart disease and diabetes and people without diabetes is in the gray area. 
So what happens with all this sugar? And this is kind of a good breakdown. It even looks a little confusing. But if we have too much sugar and then we start saying, I can't handle all that sugar, I get some resistance. And all of a sudden, uh, insulin is going up. I start storing stuff and I'm starting getting fatter. Our lab values start to change. And what happens is we start seeing imbalances here. Blood pressure comes up and now I got hypertension. I get thicker blood. I also start to get things that coagulate. Fibrinogen is one of our, our inflammatory markers, but it also shows about coagulation, so things get backed up a little bit in the thick blood. And then we have blood starting to or oxidizing, things oxidizing to the sugar. And when that does happen, we start damaging nerves. We get renal damage, vascular changes in our arteries, and intestinal tight junction breakdown, which means Sugar handling can cause leaky gut. I get all these triglycerides, I gotta store sugars, so now I have a fatty liver. And serotonin gets affected, so next thing I have brain serotonin, can I get depression? And I get increased uh, uric acid. This again shows the same type of element, but just kind of gives shows you some other parts here. So we have an insulin surge Cortisol is a reaction of the body trying to get the sugar to be balanced from the adrenal gland. So when cortisol goes up, it also puts sugar in the system and also makes insulin surges. And this is what we were talking about before. And there's a certain enzyme that's here for females that starts to have a problem. And then all of a sudden they're starting going from estrogen, creating estrogen, or estrogen to testosterone. And males start taking testosterone through a sugar aromatose pathway and making estrogen. And this leads us to all the complications of blood sugar. And it's gonna be things such as heart attacks, strokes, increased fats, hypertension, kidney disease, the small arteries of the eyes, and if you get thickened blood, that gets affected. It's the same reason why kidney has some problems. You don't get blood flow well to your to to the areas of the foot and extremities, ulcerations, uh, and it can also lead to amputation and nerve damage. I'm not getting blood flow to my nerves. So here's a review of some things. I get the food comes into the body, gets absorbed in the intestine. Gets down increasing blood sugar levels. Pancreas responds by secreting insulin. High glucose levels, insulin tries to store it in here to the liver and hopefully homeostasis is returned. So to review sugar pathway, glucose is obtained through digestion, transported by, to the cell by insulin, takes it into the cell, it's the carrier into the cell overseen by an adrenal hormone, the cortisol, the adrenal hormone. If you're not having enough sugar in the system, the adrenal will actually push in sugar in there. Received into cells by trace minerals, it's like the dormin, utilized in the cells mitochondria, stored in glycogen, uh, in liver and muscles, retrieved by a hormone called glucagon. When you're exercising, glucagon comes into play. When not needed, turn it into fat. The problem with sugar, it, it's absorbed so fast and you get, the body gets overwhelmed. And it's kind of like a mob and there's a riot and everybody's trying to go to the all, everybody's trying to run to the exits at the same time. And there's mass panic and the body just can't handle it. So it resists it, it closes it down. It's better if we get things to go into kind of like single file. And that way we can control a little bit better and we work a little bit better so we don't have so much, so much resistance against it. The one organ gets overwhelmed, the pancreas, exhaustion. High levels of sugar increase production of insulin. Pancreas gets fatigued because of keeps on putting insulin to try to deal with this thing and become inflamed. Deficiency of pancreatic enzymes they start losing and sometimes taking a pancreatic enzyme is, is helpful. Symptoms, bloating, diarrhea, nausea, abdominal pain, back pain, and fever. So the pancreas gets hit on two ways. It's getting hit on sugar but then also when you start doing that, and if you're depleted and not eating good foods, you're also affecting um, it to try to put out all these additional enzymes to help to digest food. So it's like whipping the horse on both sides. Not all sugars are created equal. Fructose is not absorbed in all cells. In fact, glucose is, but fructose is not. And sugar, these sugar are found in some fruits. 
They have a lower glycemic index than glucose in natural form, but their damage is a lot different. High fructose carbs can cause faster sugar spikes and found in lots of sweet, lots of foods that aren't sweet and has seven to eight times more potent at damaging blood vessels than glucose. And fructose only processed in the liver. The fatty liver disease, liver is involved in sugar regulation stores and releases based on need. Fructose consumption is linked directly to obesity, doesn't cause a feeling of being full, triggers liver to make body uh, want to store fat, causes rise of triglycerides and leading to weight gain. So when you have high rise in sugar and you've got too much to deal with and the mobs hitting those receptor sites, and so the insulin gets, there's resistance to get the insulin that carries that sugar into the cell. And the metabolic syndrome, which we talked about, high blood pressure, high sugar, um, those type of things that happen here. But what also is, is not only does it block the glucose going in, but possibly also getting a major potassium deficiency, it blocks that. And potassium is supposed to relax our arteries. So one of the reasons why you have high blood pressure is because of insulin resistance blocking potassium. And the result, stiff arteries, sodium retention, low potassium, phasic constriction, high blood pressure, and everything to the left. And just another chart to see insulin resistance and all the different factors that have. Here's the door closing, hormone imbalances that happen, estrogen dominance things, polycyclic ovarian. We already went through those. And just kind of a little bit of a recap. And just to drive the idea home, here's another picture here. We start getting high sugars, insulin resistance, inadequate insulin response, type 2 diabetes can happen, cardiovascular disease, all these things that happen here. If you get normal sugar, you compensate, um, but then if you do compensate over a period of time, you do all get insulin resistance, and then you'll start having some of these things. Why potassium is important? We need about 4,700 milligrams per day, and that's seven to 10 cups of vegetables, people. Four times more potassium than sodium. Physio physiological relaxer of the nervous system softens the arteries, prevents constipation, leg cramps, and nervous conductivity. A fib example, diuretics can get rid of fluids and potassium. Salt sensitive usually needs potassium. 98% of it's inside the cell, not outside. Normalizes your heart rate. Decreases tachycardia, that's fast moving heart. Deficiency, deficiency associated with labored breathing and high pulse rates. Takes insulin to control and absorb potassium. So with obesity, you also have something called leptin is produced and makes you feel full. But one of the problems is, is you get leptin resistance along with insulin resistance. So then henceforth, if I'm not getting resistance, I can't get leptin in, then what happens, I'm gonna start feeling I'm still hungry. And that's where you get this repetitive need or cravings for food. It's so important to eat well, and I can go through and probably take almost a half an hour going through all these different things that are associated with food additives. But the problem is, is you wanna eat clean because they also have influence on sugars. Because the potential harm of all these guys from uh, potassium bromate and white sugars and food colorings and monosodium glutamate, they can increase cancer risk because of the sugar problem. It can cancer loves sugar, can increase hunger, stimulate insulin release, mimic hormones, and that's not a good thing. You want the hormone to do work. We don't want to have a mimicker of it, so it can actually tell us to try to do something it's not supposed to do. Restrict absorption, strains digestive organs, affect behavior or mood, and irritate our healthy bacteria, and that's so very, very important for health and weight loss is actually our bacteria. We mentioned cortisol in several times. It's from the adrenal glands. They sit on top of our kidneys. Um, and there are stress gland. And emotional stresses causes cortisol release. Because you want to flight or flight, you want to run away, you might have to have extra energy so the body creates the sugar. So cortisol goes up, sugar goes up. But you increase sugar release to bloodstream from the liver. Impairment of insulin secretion and blocks insulin effect on cell over a period of time. Now we can see patients with perfect diet and exercise that still have diabetic patterns. So they seem to be okay while they're eating well and stuff like that, but you can still get sugar from stress.
The physiology of the stress response is important to note that we can also trigger the stress response by thinking about stressful events, dwelling on past, past stressful events like loss of a job, fight with someone, pants your mom made you wear while you're growing up, anticipating something coming up, a job interview, a test result, giving something, something, someone bad news, all powerful triggers res, trigger or powerful stress response. Again, cortisol can actually bring stress responses and sugar spikes, bring us down below our normal sugar level and create all kinds of problems like fatigue response, um, stress responses, hunger responses, because of what's happening with just the element of the stress on the emotional side. So another way to look at it, event triggers cravings, the brain sees food as an option to, to lift mood, dopamine released in anticipation, cave to temptation, serotonin release, binge eating happens, strengthens, just a vicious cycle. So you have stress, cortisol goes up, remember leptin sensitivity goes down, so that means you don't get filled, hunger increases, fat storage, there goes your weight. There is a good way to measure this, it's called the Adrenal Stress Index. It actually does on four spits that we do. This is actually a spit test that measures your cortisol levels through time. Cortisols are high in the morning and they drop down at the end of the day. And we want to see a normal pattern, but if you're having a stress response that's off, that can create some problems. It's not good just to do one because you got to look at your total load, but also where does it happen in that total load that you have a problem with. And this gives you an idea about how to supplement at certain times that your cortisol levels might be off. It's on the circadian rhythm. We want to make sure we get the rhythm right. How we handle some of this is really stress reduction and meditation helps improve sleep, alters stress response. Yoga and uh, Tai Chi I like because uh, even though Tai Chi is not written here, it's shown to reduce uh, fast blood sugar, weight loss, gives you also something to focus, breathe, and movement plays a big part. Getting enough sleep, studies have shown that even a partial night of bad sleep increases insulin and also increases inflammation. Sugar is, equals inflammation, inflammation equals pain, sugar equals pain. Now we can have an increased infection event that increases inflammation and inflammation increases. And then when that happens, we also have increased insulin resistance, decreased sugar or metabolized, increasing high blood pressure or high blood sugar and high insulin levels. And then all of a sudden we start seeing certain type of enzymes being blocked, which also can have a problem because some of these foods here can actually help block these enzymes. So promote inflammatory states. We can add some weight here that comes on, simple starches adding in here, can do a feedback loop, increase more inflammation, and the thing goes round and round and round. What causes inflammatory inflammation? Lifestyle factors. You have a abnormal mucosal barrier, that's a gut lining. And you have a leaky gut, you can also have leaky brain, liver toxicity, environmental and other uh, uh, influences, metabolic dysglycemia, as we've talked about, oxidative stress also, Dental infections play a big part. Environmental factors like heavy metals in the system, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, phthalates, and plastics. The allopathic treatment is actually to go after to treat the symptoms. And we've got things that kind of improve insulin resistance, but the problem is it prevents the liver releasing sugar. They cause bloating, gas, diarrhea, upset stomach. And so there's other things you can do here. Again, this is another type of drug uh, group, improves insulin sensitivity, but also is causes weight gain, heart failure, and fractures in some of those drugs. And the other one is, is to make the pancreas produce more insulin. Well, the problem with this is hypoglycemia and upset stomach and skin rash. And you're just beating the pancreas up until you just burn it out completely and become totally dependent for the rest of your life. So coming up with diabetes and heart disease, by far the best diet that seems to be out there, at least when you're talking about a dietary food, and we're not talking about fasting here, that type of diet is the Mediterranean diet, and it seems to be best. And it's usually the good oils that seem to be involved, good, fresh, healthy food that's grown locally.
plays a big part in their diets. Everybody thinks about Italian meals being huge pasta meals. There's a lot more to it than that. And the Mediterranean diet is seemed to be the best one to affect people with diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. This is a principle I put together. This is my own creation and it's called the psych principle and S stands for sugar substitution. Whatever I can do to decrease the glycemic index or decrease the sugar reaction in the body, that's what the S stands for. I is intermittent fasting. Can we do some fasting elements that actually kind of seems to balance out the sugars a little bit? And then of course you can still eye with or you're eating things similar to like the Mediterranean diet. Key is keto diet. How much fats can I put in? Fats burn longer. They take a lot longer to burn. Remember the fireplace we talked in the very beginning. And you always should have some type of form of exercise. One of the ways to make sure that you're actually seeing how much carbs that you're having is understanding what net carbs are. And that's your total carbs minus your total fiber. In this example, we have total carbohydrates at 37 right through here and your total fiber is four so that would be 37 minus four would give you net carbs what's interesting to see here is in this in this video in this video if you saw it was said only 12 12 grams of sugar sorry it's covered up there but they say there's 37 total carbohydrates again they're hiding the sugar probably hiding it at probably some type of starch Vegetables, especially those above ground, have a lot of fiber. So usually vegetables as a food source is kind of like um, neutral by itself. Fiber is especially important into binding up sugar so it doesn't come in like a mob. It makes things go into single file when it's going into the cell. It's a lot easier for the cell and doesn't deal with insulin resistance as much. You could use some natural sweeteners. Uh, natural sweeteners are lower in the glycemic index. But since they do take a taste on the tongue, they can cause a little bit of insulin re uh, uh, release. And insulin in blood with no sugar can cause resistance. So you got to keep that in mind. So good natural sweeteners are the raw honey, the stevia. Coconut sugar here has half the glycemic index. Again, there's some things that are helpful for insulin resistance, and I think one of the things is uh, additional help. Master Cleanse, if you're familiar with it, it's actually um, it's three quarters water, uh, a quarter of green tea to a gallon, um, maple syrup grade B. And it's a fasting element that you take for a couple days before you go into a dietary change to help you control sugar. Keto diet, again, it's going to be dealing more with fats, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Potato starch is an uncooked and soluble starch, improves insulin sensitivity. It's not cooked, so it doesn't get absorbed in the body. Uh, increases fat burning. Only thing that you have a problem with that is if you have SIBO, you might have some bloating problems associated. It's an optimized gut flora prebiotic, but if you're feeding bad bacteria, it's going to be showing a sign of SIBO. You might get some bloating and burping with that. Magnesium, potassium, important to make sure they get into the system. Magnesium is also blocked as well as uh, potassium getting in the system. Exercise, we talked to, we're going to talk about a little bit more HIIT. Um, it's actually a very, very good form of exercise. It's a spurt exercise. Um, it's actually, you have 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off. 10 minutes, you got 10 sessions of that. So that means five minutes of exercise, five minutes, five minutes of resting. Intermittent fasting, we'll get into. Apple cider vinegar at night, good for high sugar in the AM. Now, intermittent fasting. You eat an early dinner. Intermittent fasting helps fight obesity and type 2 diabetes, both of which are risk factors of, for high blood pressure. Body's more sensitive to insulin and leptin after a period of fasting, so leptin works better. Many types of fasting regimes, one of the easiest to comply with, it, which is an eating schedule where you limit your eating to a specific narrow window of time. We recommend that you eat at, you're eating at least three hours and ideally six hours prior to bedtime to give your body a significant fasting period. Fasting. Natural cleansing process is necessary for optimal cell renewal and function. It also activates stem cells and stimulates mitochondrial biosynthesis. But with that said, you can't do fasting by eating bad foods. And as it says here, 
while participants lost about 3% of their body weight by eating all of their food within an eight hour time frame, by not altering their dietary choices, which means bad foods, important disease parameters remained unchanged. Very important. There are all kinds of fa fasts, but actually a definition of fast is no caloric intake. So juice fast is not a actual fast. Fasting mimicking diet, is actually not a fast necessarily because it does have some caloric intake. Water fast is a true fast. Prolonged fast also. Intermittent fasting is not a true fast for the day because of the fact that you actually put calories in. When you put eat food, you will raise insulin. Same thing with time-restricted feeding. Circadian rhythms are important because there are certain times that the body needs to be resting. That's when you're talking to look at the farmer's diet where they go and they eat during the daylight. And by the time they're done at like 5.30, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock is when the body starts working on breaking things down and relaxing the digestive system. But if we're eating at 7, 8, or 9 o'clock, that puts a little bit of stress on the system. So time-restricted feeding, not what, but when. First week, you're going to sleep with hunger pains. Helps to go to bed early so you won't be hungry. Blood sugar changes in less than two months. Reversal of fatty liver in months. Sounder sleep. Uh, minimum of 12 hours between. There's a app you can go called the My Circadian Rhythms app to take a look at. You can get decreases in hemoglobin A1C and cholesterol. Intermittent fasting is not a diet. It's more of a pattern of eating. Triggers growth hormones. Uh, and it's one of the six, uh, one of the six of fat burning hormones and the strongest coming out of the liver in the presence of insulin. You cannot lose weight. Current trends of pancreas is pushing out five to seven times more insulin than is needed. Every time you eat, you spike insulin, not just carbs, everything you eat, even fat, you will spike some insulin in relate into the response. Human growth hormone regulates blood composition, body fluids, muscle, bone growth, sugar, and fat metabolism, and possibly heart function. Age differences, the younger the body, the more production. There's some differences in uh, uh, gender increases, and you can increase blood uh, your growth hormone by getting proper uh, sleep, weightlifting, exercise, fasting. Other different uh, benefits in heart growth hormone, GABA, it's a neurotransmitter. Um, kind of increases mood, has an effect on positive effects in Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, motivation and memory, helps with delta waves for improved sleep. No increased mortality in cancer with natural improved uh, HGH does not affect the cancer or any the change of that. One day fasting, HGH can go from 300 to 200, from 300 to 200, uh, 2000 percent. Fires arteriosclerosis, muscle mass goes up. Blood flow increases, blood pressure goes down, cardiac impact increases, congested heart failure improves. There's all kinds of different methods in intermittent fastings. And you, you might be starting out at five meals, you go down to three meals, you go to three meals, uh, 16 hour fast, eight hour foods, and then there's the more advanced ones, two meals, a 20, maybe 20 hour fast, four hour food window. Um, again, you've got to be eating really well you got to have some very good foods. You should be working with a dietitian on some of these things to make sure it's working well. And there are some exceptions. And also, we got some body type different difference in people too. So when we bring this thought press up, it's something that it works really well. But on the other hand, you got to be cautious. Some of the common problems with intermittent fasting: you use up B vitamins, so sometimes B vitamins uh, is needed. There's also a need for sea salt. They place in that, and sea salt is a very good thing for fasting. Even water fasting, I would still be taking sea salt. Too much fat um, can affect your gallbladder, liver, and pancreas, especially you get pain in the right shoulder and the neck area, under the rib cage, signs of the difficulty of handling fat. So um, you got to look at how the gallbladder is functioning. And then also, on the other hand, too, you might not be getting enough of digestive lipases from the pancreas to help with you. Okay, Major hunger with uh, blood sugar problems. Dizziness, brain fog, grouchiness, craving for sweets, may need to add another meal and add some electrolytes like bone broth or more fat, need vegetables with vitamins and minerals. You can't be eating junk food. 
And then there's the optimal fasting and fasting duration. Um, it's not necessarily water only. I want to kind of take that out there for a second, but fasting for 16 to 18 hours daily fast, um, then having a monthly three to five water only fast. That's where the water only would come into play and possibly doing 10 to 14 days once to twice yearly of a, a very longer, longer fast. But again, you'd be extremely healthy. You want to check with your dietitians before we do these. Now, when you're doing these fasting durations here, of, of those longer periods between three to five and 10 to 14, only supplement needed is sea salt and a teaspoon a day, divided doses in two liters of water. Um, but if you're hypoglycemic, which means you don't have control of having your sugars on the low end you, and your adrenals need support, you can't really do this type of fast at all. There's also something called an ACAT and an SOD. These are SNPs. These are um, uh, genetic uh, mutations in the body that some people have that were predisposed them to have problems with some fasting. Uh, eating a bad diet, as we said, must be clean. And check with a healthcare professional uh, official with some experience on this. The K part of the diet is keto diet. A keto diet is a dietary approach that focuses on minimal carbs moderate amounts of protein and high healthy fat consumption. The three keys to achieving nutritional ketosis, weight loss, anti-inflammatory, increased muscle mass, reducing appetite and lowering insulin level. Major issues on the ketogenic diets, don't combine sugar with proteins. Actually, that's the higher increase. Remember the very beginning in the quiz, what causes the most insulin resistance is actually when you combine sugar with protein. So you want to keep those separate. Remember, vegetables go with everything. Use lemon and water for clearing. Use vegetables for vitamins and minerals. It takes time for your body to adapt from dietary fat to body fat to, to burn two to six weeks. Don't forget for the signs of overuse. You just went over there. Work for your dietitian. Does well with intermittent fasting. Need a lot of fluids based Sugar-based retained water will drop a lot of water and flush out electrolytes. You need to put it back, so make sure you get the water put in there. Don't be constipated before it because you have to release toxins. So fasting versus ketosis. ketosis um, the difference is fasting is fasting will give you uh, stem cells stimulated after 48 hours, neural brain cells, neural new neural connections possibly on a water fast, on a two-day water fast. When you get into the third day, you get that. What's also interesting here too is this gut bacteria ratios. Uh, Formicutes and bacteroids ratio improve. What those ratios are or how the body controls calories coming in. So when you're after done after fasting a certain amount of time, it optimizes calorie input. When it does, it really kind of changes your gut flora and actually has a major effect on leaky gut and improves it. Arterial plaques go away, goes after scar tissue. And this is like spiritual well-being. Um, a lot of these things when people are doing fastings for their, um, uh, you know, for their religion, they seem to have like better insight, better thinking, more energy. Well, this is the reason why this is happening. And when you talk about carbs and great carbs, these are at any time. Remember, they have so much fiber in here, they almost become a net zero. And good carbs, starchy vegetables, but these are the ones that are usually underneath the ground that can be a little bit more, absolutely kind of stay away from this stuff. Some great things to do for supplements when you're going through um, trying to deal with sugar handling problems. Uh, you can supplement some of these also with some of the fasting, some of the dietary elements we talked about. Berberine is to work like metformin for insulin resistance. Alpha lipoic acid prevents nerve damage, but that's also B1 to really kind of help with that. Cinnamon, half a teaspoon, daily shown to drop sugar, 18 to 29%. Geneva rebuilds pancreatic cells, can actually kind of restore the pancreas, improves insulin sensitivity. Camel milk increases insulin uh, sensitivity. Uh, found that from a researcher out of California. Also very good for ADHD um, and uh, autism type problems. Chromium makes cells 100 times more sensitive to insulin. These are the guys that help open the door for um, the insulin to get into the cell. Magnesium, adequate levels have 71% less diabetes. Vanadium improves insulin sensitivity. And the combination of products, you usually find a lot of these in combined in the same 
product line. So you can actually get one or two uh, uh, bottles of certain supplements that actually have them in, co in combination. And vitamin D uh, is linked to increased metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes. Uh, it's been shown to average of seven points drop in blood glucose, improves insulin sensitivity by up to 50%, helps improve insulin secretion as well. And you want to bivalve, you want to be in the levels of here. The typical medical model is 30 to 100. You want to be here. Also, it's very good for the coronavirus. This is a major supplement that actually helps improve that too. Always good to monitor your sugar. If you have type, if you have pre-diabetes or type two, to keep your iron on your level, prevents uncontrolled problem and keeps a good awareness, helps analyze what your helps your sugar level. Always take a time, uh, at, take at the same time, be consistent. Morning fasting and evening post meal, both are good. Also, I would also look at possibly of getting ketone strips to see how much ketones you're producing. And are you keeping yourself between a uh, low to moderate level? And if you're high, you can add a little bit more carb. If you're low, then you can restrict more carbs in the diet. Then we have the E in the site principle for muscle mass or muscle or exercise. Using muscles burn through stored sugar. Muscles pull sugar from bloodstream. More muscle mass you have, the more sugar you can use even at rest, improves insulin resistance, keeps blood sugar lower. Again, some of the other dietary choices, low glycemic index foods, check your computer, protein and good fat and high fiber to stabilize blood sugar, avoid sugary drinks. There's a huge amount. It takes eight oranges to make a glass of orange juice. Whole unprocessed foods, balance your blood sugar, reduce inflammation and improve your liver detoxification. Omega-3 fats, colorful vegetables, nuts, seeds, uh, can help alter genetic expression to, in a positive way and improve insulin resistance. Cognitive behavioral therapy is similar. We talked about how to handle things with cortisone and stress, tai chi and yoga. Meditation is good. Heart math is another one which uses biofeedback. It uses your input from what you're currently experiencing and tells you how to calm yourself down using deep breathing exercises and maybe walking away from the particular irritation. Um, one of the key things here on heart math and biofeedback, um, heart sends signals to the brain that can influence perception, uh, emotional experience, and higher mental processes. This is when you're frustrated and it smooths out the brain, the waves, the heart rhythms, when you appreciate it or feel more balanced. So that's how the biofeedback can help you. Again, back to exercise, sh shown to have a strong blood balancing effect, loss of visceral effect, increased parasympathetic. Now, parasympathetic is the resting form. Well, you've heard of flight or flight. So flight or flight means sympathetic, means the body's in flight or flight response. Parasympathetic is the rest and digestion part of it. It increases that. So then henceforth improves insulin resistance, helps relieve stress and improves sleep, decreases cortisol, we talked about before. Detoxifying and anti-inflammatory increases muscle mass. But please exercise smart. Be cautious if you have high blood pressure. Insulin causes uh, blood pressure to rise. Start gradual if you're diagnosed with hypertension, especially if you're above 160 over 100. Talk to your doctor. And especially with any type of exercise program, this is going to be okay for me. Start with daily walking and progress this directly to make things a little bit harder. Choose exercises you can enjoy consistently, are more important than intensity. And I think a lot of times too, we get things like, well, I can't walk, it's too hot outside. Go to a large building, go to something like Home Depot, Walmart, or whatever, and walk the outside perimeter of the, uh, inside uh, the perimeter of the, of the building. Don't let, let um, things get in the way, think your way around it. One way to check your heart is a one minute uh, heart check recovery rate. And it's checking your resting heart rate at your radial pulse or carotid pulse. So once either at your neck area, right by next to your thyroid, um, the pulse on your wrist. And you want to do about a 70% peak aerobic workout. That's if you're unhealthy. Um, you don't want to be maximizing yourself on this test even for a minute. Um, you want to do it probably maybe 75%. So you can be jumping jacks, squats, stairs. And you measure your pulse um, for uh, a minute as immediately after that. This is your peak pulse. Then you wait a minute 
then recalled your pulse again. That's your recovery pulse. It's how fast your body recovers from strenuous exercise. The measurement is the difference between peak pulse minus then the recovery pulse. Less than 12 beats increased risk. If it's it doesn't decrease more than 12, there's an increased risk for heart attacks. If it's 13 to 20, it's a moderate risk. If you're between 21 and 40, it's good. So check with your, your personal care physician for a cardio workup if at high risk. Consider short workouts with long rests and recoveries. Your exercise goals should work into slowly, depends on your condition. Physically sound, do I, do I, do I need a fully, full cardio exam and stress test? Aerobic and anaerobic uh, training, cross training, changing up muscle groups, proper wa warm ups and cool downs. Chiropractic care works very, very well with dealing with these conditions. Realigning uh, the spinal and other joints, T5 to T7 uh, is important for nerve supply to the liver and the pancreas. Joint stress, if you have joint stress, release also more cortisol, more sugar in the system. Manipulation decreases cortisol and influence brain activity and gets the body to stay more in this sympathetic, parasympathetic state. Remember, sympathetic is the flight or flight response, releases a lot of cortisol. Parasympathetic is rest and digest. And there's a certain way to adjust to make that work a little bit better. Cranial bone balancing, which means the cranium, the bone, the head is not necessarily a football helmet. It has 22 uh, bones that make up that skull. Jaw muscle therapy helps relaxation. And 56 of all neural input go into the brain comes from the trigeminal nerve. It's a cranial nerve associated along the sides of the face. Again, spinal issues. Every joint talks to the brain continuously. Irritation of a joint causes stress hormones. You increase pain, you increase cortisol. You increase cortisol, you increase sugars. Nerve flow to the organ associated with the sugar metabolism. T liver, T5, pancreas, T7, mid-back pain. Those relate to those areas. Uh, and and the, really the big organs are talking about when you talk about sugar handling, it's going to be pancreas and liver. Decrease, increase the sugar, increase inflammation, increase joint breakdown, increase pain. So this is how we can get you to get work better. Taking a very good history, what is your diet, what is your stress, what's your medical history? You got some blood values we need to take a look at, and we saw those in the very beginning. Adrenal stress index is another good one to do. Neurological exams, because what happens with diabetes and sugar, sometimes they have a lot of neurological function, especially um, uh, paresthesias and things in the feet, so we have to go a good neurological exam. Orthopedic exam, what's happened in your joint structures. Applied kinesiology is actually using muscle testing to actually ask the body where the problem is. And you can actually muscle test organs and joints and things of that nature and see which ones correlate to the problem. Acupuncture is very good because it has an effect, not only is it electrical flow and moving, but actually affects blood flow and get proper blood flow into areas. In conclusion, we want to be the healthiest we can be. We want to live a very, very long life and without a lot of, of physiological problems. These pictures on this map talk about the blue zones, and these are uh, Okinawa, and then also places in Greek and in, in Greece and Italy and uh, Costa Rica and in California, where people have the highest ratio of living to 100 and lower morbidity, lower problems associated with it. They're eating good quality fats. They're not stressed much. Vegetarian diets, not loaded up with carbs, very st uh, low stress um, relationships. So when you take a look and correlate what all these guys have in common, those are the things. And they really control sugar very, very well. We have a special offer for you tonight, and that's a free chiropractic evaluation consultation to deal with your sugar handling needs. This is a two-day event. First day, we have to gather information and lab work and find out all the different things, and plus we have to do examinations to confirm or check or find things that may, may be possibly wrong uh, going with your, your system or your body. The second day, we gather that information and put together a treatment problem, a means of attack to go after your particular problem. Guaranteed, at the end of that day, you will be having things you can use almost immediately in your life. Now, what's the cost of this? It's not $225. We're going to make it $99, but we don't keep the $99. We donate it for a group called Caring for Others. It's a 501c3 nonprofit group. 
And what it is, is give money to people who can't afford care and those, those, those who can't receive that. It also provides a scholarship for alternative medicine for people who want to get some information or wants to learn some things and learn to kind of do the things that we do, but they don't have the financial ability to do so. And educational resources for the community, also including food drives that we can do for those type of things. Now is the time to start. Now is the time you've got a gateway. We take away some of the financial problems to get, get started, to take a look at, so give you a discount to get yourself started on the path to healing. And if it's not for yourself, there might be somebody else that you might want to think about. You can do that to donate to. With that, thank you very much for, to, for uh, spending the time with me and watch out for that sweet tooth. Take care.